a joy that you have found us for this podcast. How exciting it is to think that this spiritual message is going out to people around this planet. Whether your life is working at a peak level or whether it can use some enhancement, have I got the message for you today. So get a piece of paper, get ready to take notes, call a friend, have them watch this podcast also. Then you too can have something to talk about and take it to a deeper level. So enjoy. Here we go. Hey, good morning, Seaside. What a joy it is to be here today with you on a fabulous day, a day in which we have been taking a look at uh, the timeless truths for transformation. Today's is about the flow, and my goodness, what a perfect song for flow that haven't you heard, haven't you heard? You are that light of the universe. You are the bread, you are the wine, and when you know that, that is what you have to share with this world. When you come to recognize what it is you are, this is what you get to bring to life. Not what you don't have, it's what you do have. That is what is to flow forth from you and out to the universe and the world around you. And when you're in that place of flow, it comes comes back to you. It's called the law of circulation, but I like the word flow. And since I wrote the foundation class for this movement, it is one of our core concepts, flow instead of circulation, just because it's, and um, it's just, when you're in that place, it's coming back. You give here and boom, 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 it comes back here. You know, we're dealing with that which is omnipresent is everywhere. And so as you share and flow that which you are here, you, what comes back to you is here, 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 here in all areas of your life. When it's real, when it's relevant, when you need something particular. You know, I can remember when Kelly and I went to uh, the show when they were first bringing it out and testing it, uh, Jersey Boys, when they brought it out La Jolla. It was a number of years ago. You may remember it, the Frankie Valley story. And uh, we had tickets. I guess it was probably opening night tickets. And we got there and they you know, checked the tickets. They let us in. And we walked in and there were people sitting in our seats. And uh, you know, we didn't want to make a scene because you just that's not the right polite thing to do. And so I said, yeah, there's a couple of seats over there right in the center. Why don't you sit there until you know, somebody needs them or something? And so we sat down in these fantastic seats. And what we noticed on our tickets is our tickets were really for opening night, but opening night was tomorrow. And today was the preview of what was coming up. And so they had the press in there. And who was sitting literally right in front of us was Frankie Valley himself watching the premiere of his show, crying through it, just watching you know, the story. Oh my goodness. Talk about being in the flow. I couldn't have planned that. Could have gotten better seats if I tried to buy them for that premiere. And yet there we were. It is amazing when you're in that place and you're not thinking about yourself, not thinking about what can I get back, but I'm just listening to my heart and being present and in that flow. Alex is a, a professional mountain climber. I mean, the kind that goes on expeditions to the Himalayas, the Patagonias. And he shares a story of um, on one expedition, they were about six hours from the summit. They had been doing this for quite some time. And a storm had moved in, a horrendous storm. And as they proceeded, it turned into a blizzard. You know, the, just the, sh the, the winds and the ice just cutting their face. And every step is just a labor because of the altitude. It's difficult to breathe. And, um, and they were moving forward. And they found, which I guess sometimes you know, people who didn't make it on the side. And there was this one guy just lying there. And the party said, we, we've got to move on. And Alex said, but this guy could, could use some help. And they said, Alex, if you stop, you will die. You will probably join him. Um, you, and he said, for them to go on. So he went down with the guy, and the guy was not quite dead. I guess it's like, you know, it's almost as if you go to sleep. And there was a faint heartbeat. And so Alex started uh, massaging him, rubbing his hands, rubbing his face, getting the blood moving. And the guy, you know, came to, and he was able to assist him down the mountain to the base camp. And when he, Alex, and the guy were checked by the doctor, the doctor said to Alex, do you know, you probably did more than just saved his life because your limbs, your arms, and your, your legs are showing the first signs of frostbite. And had you proceeded a couple more hours, it would have set in and you would never have been able to return down that mountain. 
Talk about being in the flow, listening to that which is in your heart that may not be the wisest choice, but yet it is the right choice. When you're in the flow, you're listening. You're not judging, you're not doubting. You're saying, yes, use me, Spirit. What a great song for today. Use me, Spirit. You know, one of the classic American stories um, uh, about just, just being in that, in that flow, 75 years old, it comes from the um, Olympic Games of 1936 when I was in Berlin, Germany. Hitler is in power. He is in control. He is working on creating the Aryan race and the African Americans in the Olympics did not please him at all. And there we had just leading the pack was Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens had won three gold medals and was now vying for a fourth gold medal in the long jump, which was just his, his thing. And the crowd just, they were angry, they were booing, they were jeering him, and it was starting to play in on his psyche. They were starting to play in his mind. And here he go, he ran his first run and he jumped, and the judges said he faulted. Whether he faulted or not, that's what they said. And, um, and so as, as the, the anger from the crowds is getting in on him, he did his second jump, and he faulted again. And he only had one more attempt. And the German sports hero of their nation, Luz Long, <laughs> went over to Jesse in, cr- in front of Hitler and tens of thousands of people. And here's... Jesse wondering, does this guy hate me also? And put his arms around him. Said, Jesse, you only need to jump 23 feet to qualify. You jump 26 feet all the time. Just jump three inches before that, the line, and no one can fault you for that. And Jesse went ahead and did that, and he just flew and he qualified. I was like, wow, well, that's awesome. It came down to the finals, and Luz was now in first, and Jesse only had one more jump left. He had faulted on the first two, and he went ahead and set a world record, jumping the farthest he had ever done, winning the gold medal from Germany's sports hero of uh, ever. And you know, the first one who came over to Jesse to say congratulations was Lutz Long himself. He went over and said, great job, Jesse. And what Jesse Owens would tell afterwards is that you could take all of his medals, all of his trophies, and you could melt them down, and they wouldn't even begin to plate 24-carat relationship that he felt, the friendship he felt from Lutz Long, who went ahead and ended up dying during World War II. But you see... You're making an impression when you're in that flow and when you're giving and you're caring, you're making that impression that is a lifelong kind of thing. And when you are caring about somebody, when you're taking the time to touch their heart and their soul, you don't know how long it's gonna last. You may touch somebody and they may be remembering it for years. They may be remembering it for the rest of their life. 50 years from now, a little child whose life you were in may be remembering that time you took with them. I gotta tell you on my iPhone uh, security check, one of the questions they ask me is, who is your favorite teacher? Which obviously means the majority of the people can remember their favorite teacher. You remember one of yours? Yes and no, okay, well, they don't have it totally right, but. But what's more important is not the legacy you leave for someone, but rather the legacy you leave in them. And ooh, that was good. First service didn't get that. You know, hey, well, I, I, you know, it's, it's being in that flow, it's caring, it's being in the present moment, whether you know, somebody's on the side of the road and you need to help them down from the mountaintop or the difficulty, or just taking a moment with a child or just telling somebody how special they are in your life, it makes a difference. But all of a sudden, what begins to happen sometimes is doubt begins to slip in. Imagine if Lou said, I, I don't think I'm going to be appreciated for doing this. When doubt begins to move in, it begins to swirl within your, within your mind. It's like a vortex. It's a, it's a tornado that just begins to pick up speed. It begins to, you know, it, it begins to just feed on itself and flying. It's a, called a death spiral. You just, down you go. And the thing with doubt I want us to get and understand is it's natural. Doubt is natural. It is natural for it to show up, to creep up, to grab our awareness. Say, hey, look at me. Are you sure you got what it takes? Or whatever it is you are doubting, it is a natural state. But what you get to do is begin to not identify with it. As you identify with it, you give it power. As you begin to say, hey, there's doubt. Whoa, isn't that interesting? You begin to recognize that, you know what, there's something going on here, but I'm not going to give my power to it. I'm going to be outside the doubt. And as you begin to be outside the doubt, you can say, who is it that's doubting here? You know, 
If I'm outside the doubt and I'm observing the doubt, I'm looking at the doubt, which is kind of a meditative practice, you begin to say, wow, it kind of comes and it goes. It rises and it goes away. But what happens is we allow the frustration to get in there. We allow the, the, the frustration to, um, to show up and say, but this isn't what I wanted. I wanted it quicker. I wanted results faster in my life. I want, you know, the frustration comes when I have an expectancy, when I have an attachment to it. I'm not in the flow. When you're in the flow, okay, what comes, it goes. It rises, it goes away. When you have an attachment, you're stopping the flow. And that's where the frustration comes in. Yeah, it's like, oh, I can't push through this. You know, the frustration, this is how I want it. You know, I've taught, worked with enough people on the spiritual path, say, Christian, I have lit so many candles you know, in my life. I've burnt so much incense. I have fasted, and you know what? It's not coming. It's like I would do it, but God's not speaking to me. I don't know what to do. God does not show up on demand. What you've got to do is be in the flow. You've got to surrender. You've got to trust. You've got to be willing to realize it comes, and it goes, and it's as you be, make yourself receptive to the flow of life, to be that avenue, that channel through which it flows, you will begin to know. You'll begin to see. I shared a story uh, did a pra- with the practitioners, had a retreat yesterday, and shared a story of a lady who had a mystical experience. She was out looking at the stars, and she felt as if she was wrapped in a blanket of stars. The universe noticed her, adored her, loved her, empowered her, and then she had to come back. And that's a shock, you know, after you've been... <laughs> In the present. And then she came back and she thought her life would now be perfect. She had this great mystical moment. Yeah. And she was still in a body that was overweight and in pain. And it's like, come on, God, what was the purpose of giving me this if you're not going to make my body thin and I can eat all I want and still stay thin and not have pain? It was only as she could surrender her frustration for not getting the outcome she wanted that she began to realize that, you know what? I am noticed in the universe. You know, I am wrapped in this amazing blanket of spirit. But we've got to be willing to be in the flow and not be attached to what it is, to be in the flow and trust where it is I'm guided, not to buy into the fear and the concern that it's not happening the way in which I want to, to be there, to be able to move through that fear. You know, actually, that's the only way you get through fear. Fear is to get through it. You can't think yourself around the fear. I would like this to go away, and I just want to walk around it, not through it. Flow is going through. Yes, you know, um, we've got our place in Montana, and you sit outside at night, and you look at the stars, and absolutely could understand how this one woman could be embraced in the blanket of stars. And my head starts going back to westerns, and you know, and all those cowboys and mountain men who like live out in the forest where I'm at, and um, they, you know, they sleep on the ground, and they don't fear any animals are going to get them. You know, the Native Americans, the the first people of our nation, they lived out there. They didn't have a Ritz Carlton to to move. There, there was no concern. Candace told me she did temp camping through the mountains of the United States several times and she was never eaten by critters. And there I am sitting outside by a campfire alone at night listening to the wolves howl over here in this ravine and the coyotes howl over there in that ravine and the cackles showing up on the back of my neck and thinking, whoa, this is... Uh, um, I want to walk in the woods. It's a full moon. It's a beautiful sky. But when the fear begins to take over, those wolves and coyotes, which have distinctively different howls, I'll assure you, I'm sure they're not in the ravines over there, that they are about ready to pounce on me any second. And now the only way I can get through this fear is I can't walk around and go in the house and say, oh, I don't fear anymore. The only way I can do it is begin to walk down our driveway and off into the trees and begin to surrender to that fear. And what happens for me anyways is the concept of the grizzly bears out picking up on my scent thinking I would make a nice midnight snack for them (laughs) and so there it is I get to choose in the moment do I want to go with the flow which is far greater than my fear and the only way is to move out into the woods at night alone and be able to move through the fear and the fear at this point is hypnotic it makes those animals seem a lot closer I start to practice affirmations in reverse they are not eating me they're not going to eat me they're not going to eat me they're not going to eat me 
I'm, you know, and it becomes constrictive. The heart feels palpitating, like it's heart attack, cold sweat. But moving through it all of a sudden, when I allow that flow of life, when I remove my blockage, when I remove my doubts, when I remove my fear, when I remove my frustration, that flow of life begins to go through me and what happens is an ease, what happens is a joy, what happens is a courageousness, what happens is an aliveness, what happens is I begin to see the beauty of the stars and the moon and the towering trees and smell that fragrance and know that I'm one with my brother bear and sister wolves or whatever that saying is, that I am part of this natural scene because I am part of the flow of life, not dinner. 